Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. You can support this podcast on patreon.com forward slash first paw media. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by First Paw Coffee Company, specializing in private label premium blend coffee. If you're serious about coffee, you should check it out. First Paw Coffee's passion is high quality, small batch roasted coffee. They take the extra time to taste and get everything perfect before they release new blends. They aim to bring you a cup of happiness each time you pour yourself some coffee. Find out more at ak.dog slash free and enter for a chance to win some First Paw Coffee prizes, a book from our collection and tote bag. One winner will be selected at random each month. That's ak.dog slash free. Radio Free Palmer 89.5 KVRF presents Mushing Radio, hosted by Robert Forto. Mushing Radio is about dog-powered sports, living in the Great White North, and mushing. Visit our website at mushingradio.com. Here is your host, Robert Forto. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert Forto and you're listening to Mushing Radio here on KVRF 89.7 in the Matsu Valley. RadioFreePalmer.org is our live streaming site and you can find all of our episodes over on DogWorksRadio.com. Be sure to search social media at DogWorksRadio and you can follow us along. And if you will, please hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to this podcast. And today we have a guest that is returning to talk about an expedition that he did earlier this year in honor of the 1925 serum run, the Sepala Siberian Sled Dog, Togo, and much more. His name is Jonathan Hayes. Jonathan, how's it going tonight? It's great. It's a pleasure to be back. Well, thank you very much for joining us again. In our last couple of episodes here on Mushing Radio, we talked to a producer of the documentary that we're going to mention tonight, Jeremy Grant, and uh, we got a heck of a lot of history from you about the Sepala Dog, Togo, and all the history that led up to an expedition you did last February. So let's just jump right into this. You did a, uh, a solo expedition, I believe it was, what, 260, 280 miles, is that right? Yeah, it was intended to be 261 uh, there roundabouts to uh, you know, to commemorate the 261 miles that Togo and Sepala uh, mushed. Uh, it ended up being 285 miles. 285 miles in the main north woods in the middle of February, in the middle of a pandemic, with really no support other than uh, a couple of um, uh, meetings with a filmmaker whom you just met shortly before the expedition. Is that right? Yes. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I had seen his work. Uh, he, he loves the North Main Woods. Um, there, there's a, a rich heritage here, and he's a, a great um, proponent of the North Main Woods. He creates a lot of uh, of great video content on YouTube um, promoting the, the North Main Woods. And so when I was asked by Cindy Robbins, the head of Poland Spring Resort, if, if I knew of anyone who might would be willing to take this on as a documentary, I said, well, I don't know anyone, but if we could get anybody, we should get Jeremy Grant. And so I reached out to Jeremy and uh, as, as he suggested uh, when you interviewed him uh, with, within short order, you know, felt like he was my brother from another mother. You know, <laughs> we we just had a lot in common and, and hit it off really well. And uh, yeah, it, it was great to do this, and you know, great to have uh, have him be a part of it with us. And I really enjoyed my time with Jeremy on the episode he and I recorded, and I checked out his Instagram feed right after we got off the air. And my goodness, that guy can take some marvelous photos with his drone. I'm sure you've checked that out. And uh, you did not uh, pull any punches back when you brought him on to, uh, to be the, uh, the, um, the, the visual storyteller, if you will, uh, with this uh, expedition. You, you got a real catch there, didn't you? I really did. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a true Maine outdoorsman and, uh, and he has a gift. Uh, his, his artistry is, is best shown, I think 
in his Allagash River canoe trip um, mini documentary that he had posted. This is the largest documentary he's made, but that Allagash Wilderness Waterway canoe trip um, documentary really uh, displayed his talent. And I knew if, if he could bring that to this, it would, you know, it would be epic. And, and he has, uh, I know it's not public yet, but um, uh, we did have a premiere at Poland Spring Resort uh, for the documentary. And uh, I, I don't know how he did it, but he had teary eyes all throughout the room by the time it was done. So he, he is a, he's a gifted, he's a gifted artist. He truly is. I'm so forward looking to see this documentary as well as a lot of our listeners as well. There is a, uh, a trailer both on Jeremy's show page as well as this one here. So, Jeremy, let's do a little bit of uh, the logistics of this. You, you said that it was about 285 miles. You did it last February. What was the trip like itself? Uh, where did it take place? Did you go from, you know, where was point A, where was point B? Was it a circular route? Uh, how many days? You know, just sort of break it down for us. Sure. Uh, so I, I, I was honored to have the, the president of the Canyon Crown Sled Dog Race because there was no race this year uh, come out to see me off in the town of Fort Kent. And there was some press and media there. And of course, my family. Um, the Allagash Wilderness Waterway is one of the few rivers that flows uh, flows north um, in, in the lower 48. And uh, so I headed south after I reached the town of Allagash and um, continued ascending um, cause, uh, ascending the Allagash uh, Wilderness Waterway. So um, it, it was a straight shot pretty much from Fort Kent uh, west to the remote logging village of Allagash. And then from there, uh, it was um, it was 200 and another 200 and... Uh, 30 miles south uh, to uh, Greenville, to the town of Greenville on Moosehead Lake, which is the largest freshwater lake. Uh, it's 45 miles long. I know that because I must up 45 miles of it. And um, and that that town is also very noteworthy uh, for anyone who loves literature. Henry David Thoreau always used the town of Greenville as his launching place to explore uh, the Northwoods. And I ended in Thoreau Park um, uh, seven days later. And uh, it was, I, I had caches of supplies at what we call sporting camps. And I'm not sure if that's a universal term, but hunting camps, um, lodges that are closed down for the winter in the Northwoods uh, allowed me to cache my supplies there. And then um, once one of them invited me to stay as, as their guest and that caught on and I really have to, you know, thank the, the, uh, the, the sporting camps for their hospitality along the way. I carried two days worth of supplies, uh, on the sled and the sled incidentally was, uh, built by Don Hibbs, who's a five time Can-Am Crown 250 winner and a veteran of the Yukon quest. And, uh, he actually came out on the trail. This didn't make the documentary, but he came out on the trail one of the most low, remote locations uh, just to meet up with me and give me some words of encouragement. So that was really great. And uh, Jonathan, you had mentioned uh, at, at the first of your description that you did uh, quite a bit of running along the, I believe you call it the Allagash River there in Maine. And that's a very common occurrence and a very uh, uh, common occurrence in the serum run as well, because, you know, the rivers up here in Alaska are the highways. Uh, many of the, uh, the miles on that relay were spent along the Yukon river. Was that similar to what you did there in your neck of the woods? I, I wish it could have been more similar. It would have made my trip easier. Uh, the reason why I chose the coldest week of the year is we had an exceptionally warm season last year. Uh, I, I live uh, on, on Long Lake in northernmost Maine, and um, at the at the beginning of January, it wasn't even frozen up yet. Usually, it's um, frozen up at the beginning of December. Um, the head of the Allagash Waterway for the federal government, uh, Matt LaRoche, reached out to me. He said, I don't think the waterway is going to be, the ice this year is not going to be stable enough for you. It's, you know, it's dangerous. So, um, I was blessed. Uh, I have a friend who's an Allagash Waterway Ranger, uh, Trevor O'Leary. We give him a shout out. 
and uh, he did some scouting for me. So I'd, I'd drop on to the river um, for a while, and then I'd come off the river, um, you know, where the currents are stronger and the ice was thinner, and then drop back on again. So, uh, But we, we, we shadowed the Allagash Wilderness Waterway. Um, and, and you asked how, how the trip was. Um, the, the first day was about 10 miles longer than I thought it was going to be. Um, and then the next two days were uh, what you all would call hills. We call them mountains here in North Maine, but <laughs> you all would call them hills. Um, a, lot of, a lot of hill climbing. And I thought, man, I just can't wait. Not, you know, and it was cold. It was really cold. It was great. Um, but I, I thought, man, I can't wait to get the dogs onto the lake travel um, for two or three days later on in, in the expedition. And what I thought was going to be a reprieve ended up being uh, three of the most grueling days that I had. The temperatures, we had about 10 or 12 inches of fresh snow. The temperatures went up to 36 degrees. We had an overflow. Um, and literally, I mean, you, you'll see it in the documentary, it literally just a, a slug fest for days, you know, with slush up to my, to my knees. I um, did get uh frostbite on my pinky toes but uh it healed up i i've still got all my digits J- jonathan you are describing expedition mushing uh in detail that that's what happens every day out there on the trail it's not uh like sprint mushing is it where you're on a uh you know a, a glass uh, you know uh, perfectly glass groomed trail where you you know hit the trail and you pack up and go home and sleep in a hotel the next night it's not the same is it no, it's not. And, you know, for the most part, I am blessed to be able to run on uh, packed snowmobile trails, groomed trails here in northern Maine. Um, but I only had that on day one of this expedition. Uh, the remaining, uh, for the first 55 miles, uh, the remaining uh, trip, um, I, I was, um, I had the fortune of having some friends, um, some hunting guides and some uh, Allagash uh, an Allagash uh, waterway ranger that uh, scouted a trail for me and I was able to use their single track snowmobile uh, tracks, um, you know, to, to plug my way through. So it wasn't all completely breaking trail, but anyone who's mushed knows that, you know, one or two passes of a snowmobile through uh, February snow, you know, that's, you know, four feet deep is, is not a, a packed groom trail and uh, had two big snowstorms while I was out there and uh yeah did, did a lot of uh, there was there was a few times i was walking in front of my team <laughs> and just you know uh, knee deep in snow and, and the dogs are chest deep in snow and we just uh we plugged away i i love the stories that's my favorite type of mushing you know i've done everything i've done mid-distance races long distance races sprint races dry land everything and by far what you describe is is my favorite way to travel by dog team it's grueling and exhausting but man what uh what a way what a way to see the country am i right oh it's great and and, and it truly is i mean you know it, it, until you break away from those highly traveled areas and, and packed trails and get out into the forest um you, you, you're missing you're missing so much of the magic and the beauty of it out there there's i, I call it the primal trinity there's this primal trinity of you know, nature, the dogs and you, it's out there, you know, connecting and, and it really, it, it's a spiritual way. There's no other way to describe it really. That's awesome. So with this expedition, you had mentioned that it was about 285 miles over seven days and you had a relatively small dog team, eight dogs. Is that right? I had eight dogs. Yes. Um, it was, it was small. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as I noted to the videographer, you know, uh, uh, these big race teams, you know, let's say the K&M crown 250, you know, they might be picking their 12 best dogs from a kennel of 20 or 30 dogs. But at the time I had eight adults and eight adults is what went on this expedition. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, as, as we say, you know, beggars can't be choosers. So, um, and, and that that's one of the struggles with being a, a kennel that is dedicated to a breed. It's really easy to add on sled dogs and to get great sled dogs, you know, great Alaskan Huskies. You know, I've got friends that would have lent me dogs um, and I could have filled out the team and it would have been an easy stroll. But um, 
that, you know, that, that would have defeated the purpose. You know, I, I wanted to show that, you know, not only on, on the, on the race circuit as Doug Willett showed back in, in the nineties, but, also on you know on an expedition these dogs were still capable of doing you know what made them famous 100 years ago a really good friend of mine dave Shear, who's done multiple iditarods and yukon quests told me when i first arrived in alaska that a a nine dog team can take you anywhere you want to go in alaska and i think that you have proven that point as, as well as i have Many times over, you don't need a huge team to get from A to B. Of course, the extra power helps, but it's a heck sure. of a lot easier to manage a small team compared to a 16-dog string that's well over 100 feet long. And thinking back to the historical aspect of this, Jonathan, that was more typical back in the day. They didn't have long strings of dogs back in the uh, serum run days. Typically, they were smaller trap line, trap line type teams, weren't they? Yeah, especially, you know, the, these uh, mail run mushers that were uh, going, you know, from roadhouse to roadhouse. And, um, you know, of course, you know, the big uh, gold mine companies that, you know, like the one that Leonard Zeppelin worked for in Nome had, you know, a large, large kennels of dogs that, you know, ran supplies. And so he could put, you know, a large 20 plus team together, but that wasn't, as you, as you rightly pointed out, that definitely was not the norm. And, uh, you know, I read a lot of, um, the cane expeditions and the, and the, um, actually the, the Isaac Hayes expedition and uh, other, um, explorers and uh you know eight, eight, eight dogs anything over eight dogs is um was almost unheard of you know when, when you're doing backcountry work like that so with with this trip over a seven day period jeremy would typically travel from one of these uh, stopping points to the other and we talked about on his episode that that is pretty typical of a handler and we talked about uh, how the Yukon Quest handlers uh, are uh, required to do so much driving along the trail, and, and often they will they will drive double the distance that the uh, that the dog team will go because they just have to get from you know from checkpoint to checkpoint. Aside from that, you know, in terms of meeting up with you to get footage and interviews and all of that. Did he have any other role with the trip or was his sole role to document what was happening? It, my, my goal was to be a solo self-supported um, expedition, um, you know, self-supported meaning I, I'd sent out caches and, you know, carrying two days of supplies so that if anything happened and I couldn't make it to my next cache that, you know, I, I'd be all set. Um, so, uh, and that, and that's why, I, I was listening to his interview with you, and I, I've got to tell you that uh, it wasn't the sled itself that was heavy. <laughs> it's 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 what uh, you Alaskans refer to as the rookie bulge. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to be prepared for any eventuality on the trail. So, um, you know, I I uh, I was I was carrying the kitchen sink, and um, you know, of course, I I started weaning that down as I went. Um, and I don't want to give everything away from the ex, uh, from the documentary because you know there's some there's some key points that I'm intentionally leaving out so that uh, that uh, you know it'll have its its primary thrust when people get to watch it. But um, I, I uh, there there was I think two points that he could not he wanted to um, rendezvous with me and couldn't. Um, the big thing that became apparent to me. Um, was that, uh, you know, I, I, you know, like most mushers, I feed a mix of kibble and meat and, uh, the kibble you know, and the, the brand will remain nameless, although, you know, it was high protein, high fat meat based kibble. Um, the dogs just refused to eat it after day two and they just, they just flipped to meat. And so that created a logistical problem for me, for me, if I wanted to keep, keep going, I had to supply meat for them. Um, I, I do want to, um, you know, do this real quick shout out. I've, um, you know, uh, switched over and using a really great dog food. Now I'm currently using uh, native, uh, and now that we're in the season, I'm using native four and my dogs are thriving on it, and, you know, really enjoying it. But, um, so 
I, I did make a satellite call out to Jeremy, and at one point he was able to bring me some extra meat. At another point, he was not able to rendezvous with me, and I came up to a uh, uh, to a sporting camp, and uh, the, you know they were asking me how it was going, and I was having a lot of anxiety about the dogs, you know, needing more meat, and my supplies running low. And they said, hey, well, you know, we've got a um, you know game wardens bring us moose all the time, and I said, you know. Give it to me. Give it to me. So I, I became I became a butcher for a morning, just you know, uh, preparing meat for the dogs. And but uh, yeah, at, at every stage, um, it uh, it came together. And uh, and Jeremy um, really put himself out there, as I knew he would. Um, you know, he's uh, he's not afraid of the elements. He's not afraid to you know to tough it out to get to get the shot that he needs. And uh, watching the documentary, you know, everyone's like, wow, you know you know, Jonathan's dogs did so great. And I'm like, they did, but Jeremy <laughs> did really great too. And you, you don't, you don't think about the, the videographers and you don't think about, you know, the, you know, the production that goes into this stuff when you're watching something like this. But yeah, um, he, he, he put in as much work just in different, I think he said he had about 170 hours of video footage that he, um, you know, had to boil down into a one hour documentary. So, uh, just just that seems like a painstaking process to me. So you had, you had mentioned in that uh, part of our conversation that you don't want to give away uh, the documentary, and, and that's always my sole intention when we do shows like this, whether we're talking about movies or books or whatever, is to whet the people's appetite so they will be excited to see the film. This is sort of that uh, behind-the-scenes extras on the blu-ray if you will when you receive sure. a, a dvd movie so i appreciate uh, uh you not telling the whole story for sure jeremy or excuse me uh jonathan uh when you and jeremy would hook up after the uh after it was all over this is again kind of a behind the scenes part of this uh did you get to um be a part at all of about uh, of what was in the end of you know the end product or did you leave that solely up to his creative discretion well he is such a and you know i'm 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 not saying this because for any reason he's not paying me i, I don't get anything out of this documentary i just i just i'm saying this because it's true he is a creative genius he's very gifted with what he does and I did not want to meddle in his creative process at all. Um, there, there was um, three, ne- three major themes that begin to weave themselves into the, into the, the expedition, and one of which, you know, I'm, I'm leaving out, you know, for, for the document. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the story of, you know, of Togo and the main history and, and, the, and the dogs doing this expedition, but. Uh, there, there's another layer, and it really, um, and he he wove it all together so beautifully. It re- the, really, the only thing that I'll say about it is, um, yeah, I, I I don't believe uh, in just chance. I, I believe that um, I believe in providence. I think that things happen for a reason, and um, there's just so many serendipitous things that took place. Um, but you know, a few things in particular that that he highlights that. Uh, just really, you know, it brings, it ties everything together so beautifully and makes things, you know, uh, really, really touching. Awesome. I, I cannot wait to see it. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of our friends and fans that are listening are really excited now that we've dedicated three shows to this. Uh, that is almost unheard of where we do that. Uh, Jeremy, but I think that your story not only had to be told in the documentary, but here on the radio and on the podcast, because it is such an interesting story in our history, in our sports history in particular, and one that I am very fond of as well. Uh, Jeremy, before we go, we just have a few minutes. Uh, We talked about at the top of this show, as well as your previous shows, that this is a family affair. Your uh, your kids are involved with mushing as well. Can you quickly tell us what they're up to in the sport and what plans they have in the coming years? I, I'd love to. Um, all of my children, and uh, I have a lot of children. <laughs> all of my children love mushing. This is a family affair, and you know, uh, I can't even say I couldn't do this without them because. We do this together. It's a family project. My oldest son's 21. Uh, he 
uh, serves in the Marine Corps. He, he just assisted in the evacuation in Afghanistan, and uh, he loves mushing. It's, all, it, it's his in place, and he's looking forward to to this winter when he can come home and and uh, and do some mushing. Uh, my my daughter, we we had Canadian Eskimo dogs also in our kennel, our Canadian Inuit dogs and. My 19-year-old daughter can, you know, grab 200-pound Canadian Inuit dogs and hook, yeah, at a time as she's hooking them up to the sled. Uh, my sons, Caleb and Christian, have a YouTube channel, the Hayes Brothers, and um, they both are very, very active, especially as, because of their age. They're now 17 and 14, very active in uh, helping train the dogs and um they just made a, a great video we posted on Facebook about um, uh, sled dog nutrition. They both ran against each other. They competed against each other in their first Can-Am Crown uh, a year and a half ago when, when we had our last Can-Am. Uh, the last one was canceled because of COVID. And uh, so I've kind of, and and uh, I don't want to leave them out. Sophia and Elizabeth, our, our younger girls, um, are like nipping right on their heels. They, they don't even want to wait until they're older. They want to be racing now and, you know, they're, they're already vying and pushing the boys for, you know, the, the race slots. But uh, I've kind of, I, I'm kind of assuming the role of, you know, I want to, I want to be running the 250 miler uh, Canyon Crown. I want to be running it consistently, but I've, I've for now I've assumed the role of uh, the, the coach. I, I train the dogs, I train the kids and uh, I get, I get probably way more pride watching my kids cross the finish line than uh than if I were crossing it myself. What a cool story. What a cool family. It's, it's been a pleasure to have you on, Jonathan. Real quickly, before we run out of time, where is the best place that people can connect with you on a on an individual basis, on a personal basis? Is it Facebook, Instagram, Twitter? Where can folks find you, Jonathan, online? Um, I, I am pre- uh, almost everything I post is public. I do um, use Facebook a lot. Um, it's Jonathan Nathaniel Hayes. Our kennel is Mush Main, and uh, our kennel is Poland Springs Apollo Kennels. But for for ease of finding on the internet, we uh, for, for our internet purposes, it's just Mush Main. And our website is mushmain.com, and we've got a great blog on there too, where we share our adventures. Excellent. So on behalf of my guest over the last couple of shows and to wrap up our series on the, the documentary True North, a, uh, a story about uh, Jonathan's expedition across the state of, of Maine in honor of a very special breed of dogs. We look forward to seeing that documentary and we'll definitely keep in touch when, uh, when it does drop. This is Robert Forto for Mushing Radio. We will see you guys next time. Goodbye. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by First Paw Coffee Company. Learn more at firstpaw.coffee. From Dog Works Radio, this is Mushing Radio. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we invite you to subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link on the episode notes. You can tap or swipe on the episode cover art, and you'll see some offers from our sponsors. You can support our show by supporting them. If you like what you have heard, we would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe, too. Your hosts are Alex Stein and Robert Forto. Our producer is Robert Forto, created for Dog Works Radio. Did you know that Alaska Dog Works trains service dogs for those in need throughout North America? Each and every service dog that is trained through the Lead Dog Service Dog Program and Michelle Forto and her team has an individual training plan. We train for autistic, mobility, psychiatric, and PTSD for our soldiers for service work. If you know of someone that may need a service dog, please take a moment and check out Alaska Dog Works on social media and at alaskadogworks.com.